Oh, all right. All right. Anyways, you know, it's been a while since we've been here because of the Christmas break, which was a blessing, and we've been doing so many studies about uh, the Lord Jesus Christ and his birth. But we're back here tonight uh, continuing our studies in Exodus. And the last time we studied, we were working our way through the, the 14th chapter, which is uh, the time that the Lord takes them across the Red Sea as the children of Israel cross the Red Sea. I believe last time we worked our way through to about uh, verse uh, 13 when Moses uh, said unto the people, Fear ye not, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will show to you today. For the Egyptians, whom ye have seen today, ye shall see them again no more forever. The Lord shall fight for you, and ye shall hold your peace. And then for 15, the Lord said unto Moses, Wherefore criest thou unto me? Speak unto the children of Israel that they go forward. But lift thou up thy rod and stretch out thine hand over the sea and divide it. And the children of Israel shall go on dry ground through the midst of the sea. And I, behold, I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians, and they shall follow them. And I will get me honor upon Pharaoh and upon all his host, upon his chariots and upon his horsemen, and the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I have gotten me honor upon Pharaoh, upon his chariots, and upon his horsemen. And so the story being at this point here, the children of Israel had come out of the promised land after the Passover. They were now encamped by the edge of the Red Sea. They turn around and here comes Pharaoh and the full host aiming at them and their defenseless people <laughs> facing an army. And they cry out to uh, Moses. And, of course, they cry out in verse 11, you know, you wanted to kill us because there were no graves in Egypt. And uh, Moses just assures them to turn to God. When you have a problem, just, just turn to God. <laughs> Fear ye not. Stand still. Be still in the Lord. Wait upon the Lord. Listen for the still, small voice of the Lord. And of course, this is how God wants to speak to us as Christians today. But historically, we see what's going on here is uh, the Lord is going to complete the deliverance of these people. He's already brought them forth out of Egypt and has redeemed them by the blood of the Lamb. But now what he's going to do is to deliver them entirely from the enemy, from the host that's against them. Now, I know how we feel as Christians. We have been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. But we still have a host around us giving us problems. There's a day when our full deliverance will come when we cross the sea on our way up to heaven. And there, the sea right now that divides uh, heaven and earth, uh, we read about it when we studied Genesis, the deep, the firmament of water that separates heaven from earth. And one day when we go up there, we'll be fully delivered. But as it is now, we face a host of trouble <laughs> daily comes in all shapes and forms and varieties and with different names to it. Some members of our family, some uh, co-workers, some neighbors, and we face a host all the time of trouble. How are we to respond? Sometimes we want to just get angry, like the children of Israel did at Moses. Sometimes we want to holler at the pastor. Sometimes we want to holler at a brother in the Lord. And the Lord just wants to speak the same message to us. Just fear ye not. Stand still and let God work. At times when we need deliverance, are we going to lean upon the arm of the flesh? Or are we going to lean upon God and His Spirit and His provision? And the Lord would have us to lean upon His provision. You know, one of the things that we do, and I almost say I can't blame us because <laughs> we grew up in America and we've learned many ways to handle problems. There are all kinds of self-help gurus out there that will tell you ways to be assertive and to take care of problems when they come up in your life. But, but I'll tell you, the Lord sometimes would like you to just stand still, rein in your spirit, and let His Spirit have its way. And let Him deliver you. And let Him work on your behalf. But so often the problem with us is we get ahead of God. Jonah got into that problem. He got ahead of God. You read about that in the book of Jonah. You've got to learn how to come back and let God do His work. And so the same message comes through to us spiritually. Now, as I, as I look through this historically, I want to show you when the Lord told Moses in verse 16 to lift up the rod and stretch thine hand over the sea and divide it, he said the children of Israel shall go on dry ground through the midst of the sea. 
a promise is made by God that he's going to deliver the people and they're not going to get sullied in the experience. He's not going to let them get wet with the experience. They're going to go through on dry ground. Historically, they crossed on dry ground. This is a bona fide miracle. Historically, this is a great miracle that actually occurred. I was doing some study on uh, the topography of that particular region in the Red Sea. Let me show you. I've got a, an atlas here. The continent of Africa. There it is. You see that big continent there? Now, right about where I am would be the Indian Ocean. And an extension of the Indian Ocean, an arm of the Indian Ocean that goes up in this direction right here, is the Red Sea. It separates the northeast part of the continent of Africa. Here's Egypt, here's the Sudan, there's Ethiopia. It separates that part of Africa from the Arabian Peninsula. There's Saudi Arabia. And as you work your way up the Red Sea, it, div it, it divides like a V into two fingers extending upwards. And I'll show you on another map. Here's the Red Sea, and now there are the two fingers that go up. And here's Egypt on this side, and the fingers cause a peninsula in here. This is the peninsula of Sinai, where Mount Sinai is. And this separates the region of Sinai, and then up there is Israel, and over here is the Arabian Desert. This gulf here is called the Gulf of Suez. This gulf here is the Gulf of Aqaba. These are two bodies of water here. Now. The children of Israel had come out of Goshen, and they were on this part of the Red Sea, the Gulf of Suez. Now, the Gulf of Suez is significant in size. I pulled out the Encyclopedia Britannica. It has a diagram here of it. The Gulf of, first, the Red Sea is very large. The Red Sea is 1,400 miles long by 200 miles wide. The Red Sea is larger than California. It's a big area. It looks small on that map, but it's a large area. The Gulf of Suez extends from the inlet at Jabal all the way up to the town of Suez. It's 195 miles long. And it varies in its width from between 22 miles to the narrowest area is 12 miles across. So we're looking at crossing at minimum. If they were at the narrowest area, and I was just trying to take a look here, when they came out of Goshen, maybe they landed right in this area here, kind of this little inlet. This is a 12-mile area that they would have to cross. 12 miles is a significant walk. Okay? Those, my wife and I like to go out for a walk okay, every so often. We'll do a mile and a half. We get tired. We go home and have a bagel. You know, we're not big on exercise. And we're walking on dry land in a neighborhood in June and July. We won't even go out now. We don't even consider it. 12 miles is, is a significant walk. And you're talking about going across water for 12 miles. Now, I was reading about the depth of this, this sea. This sea is exceedingly deep. It says uh, the deepest part of the sea is 9,580 uh, feet deep. Now, when you get into the area of the Gulf of Suez, it's probably the shallowest area. It gets as shallow as 200 feet. That's as shallow as it gets, 200 feet at the Gulf of Suez. So, so you're talking about a significant miracle. You're talking about separating water a distance of 12 miles across and 200 feet deep. Now, I got a pool, and that pool is eight and a half feet deep. And once we emptied it out, I don't remember why we did it, but we emptied it out. And I was standing at the bottom of that eight and a half foot thing looking up there and thinking, that's pretty deep. I can't imagine standing at the bottom of something and looking up 200 feet and seeing water on either side of me. 200 feet. Well, how many stories is that? If, if, if there's eight feet in a story, that's got to be like 20, 30, 24 stories high. You're talking about standing at the foot of a 24-story building and looking on each side and looking at 12 miles across. And God says they're going to go across on dry ground. Now, I know there's some goofy people that want to contest this miracle, and that's all right. It's a free world. God gives you a free will. You can deny it. That's fine. I, I understand that. 
I probably denied it myself before I was saved. But what's even crazier to me is Christians, that they don't want to deny the miracle, but they want to doctor it up to give God a hand and say, well, we really didn't cross the Red Sea, we crossed the Reeds Sea. I'm not even sure where that is. And that's like a little pond, apparently, that gets about three feet deep. And, and uh, so this little three-foot-deep pond, and it may be about a few hundred feet across. That's not such a big miracle to cross that. I mean, again, my wife and I could probably do it with our boots on. Of course, what would be a miracle there would be drowning Pharaoh and his host. That'd be probably a bigger miracle than crossing the other way. So, so I don't know either way you put it. You've got a miracle on your hand. But the point is, why don't you just believe it the way God said it in the Bible? Amen. And God tells you they're going to go across on dry ground. Now, now, he says this repeatedly, I found over and over. He says it, of course, in verse 16. The children of Israel shall go on dry ground through the midst of the sea. He tells you later on in the 22nd verse, And the children of Israel went into the midst of the sea upon dry ground. He says it again in verse 29. He says, But the children of Israel walked upon dry land in the midst of the sea. Uh, he, he says it again in the next chapter somewhere. I can't remember where it is. I think it's the 15th chapter, verse 19. I think he quotes it one more time, for the horse of Pharaoh went in with his chariots and horsemen into the sea, and the Lord brought again the waters of the sea upon them. But the children of Israel went on dry land in the midst of the sea. And of course, you'll find it later on in the Psalms, and you'll find it other places in the Bible. God is making it plain and clear. At least, here's what God's saying. Allow me to say this, and put it forth a number of time, and this is my word, and then you do what you want with it. You have a free will. Of course, I believe what God said. He said they went across on dry land. A significant miracle. The, the shallowest part of that canal is 200 feet. That's the shallowest part. We'll assume they went to the narrowest and shallowest part. Still a significant miracle. Spiritually, as I read through the passage, a couple things crossed my mind as, as I looked at this. First off, one commentator was saying, it almost seems as though God is contradicting himself a little here, where he tells them first in verse 13, he says, uh, Moses said unto the people, Fear ye not, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. And then later on, uh, he says in verse 15, And the Lord said unto Moses, Wherefore criest thou unto me? Speak unto the children of Israel that they go forward. So I said, Wait a minute, you want me to stand still or do you want me to go forward? So as I looked at it, I was reading through it and, and the Lord kind of brought a parallel passage in the book of Romans to mind to show me a spiritual significance of this passage right here. Let me show you a spiritual application of what's happening in these few verses here in the book of Romans. Keep your finger in Exodus and turn to Romans chapter 3. A spiritual application of, of the actual physical event that took place historically. All right, once we have Romans 3 and we've got Exodus in our hand, the first thing that we happen is the 12th verse, we hear the people crying out, and they're saying at the end of verse 12, um, it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians that we should die in the wilderness. So the last words we hear out of the mouths of the people is this talk about dying in the wilderness. And then it made me think of over in the book of Romans, the wilderness Paul is talking about in Romans chapter 3, verse 9. What then? Are we better than they? No and no wise, for we have before proved, both Jews and Gentiles, that they all are under sin. Now think about this group that went out from Egypt. We read earlier, not only did the Jewish people go out, but many Egyptians followed them. There was a mixed multitude. So we had Jews and Gentiles and in their minds are saying, we're going to die in the wilderness. And the Bible's saying right here that we're all under sin, Jews and Gentiles. We are all in the wilderness of sin. And the fact is, we could end up dying in the wilderness of sin. As a matter of fact, later on in this, if, this is a great passage, Romans chapter 3, verses 10 through 20. I don't know if you've ever read it. I've read it a number of times. I've preached it on the streets. And then quickly had to turn to the grace of God because this is not popular preaching. But you read these passages in here and they're rough. I mean, Paul is making it very plain and clear that we're sinners. Verse 10, there's none righteous, no, not one. Verse 11, there's none that understandeth. There's none that seeketh after God. They're all gone out of the way. 
that together become unprofitable. There's none that doeth good, no, not one. He goes on to talk about the wilderness that we're in. We've pretty much driven ourselves into it. We're in a wilderness of sin. Verse 20, Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. We're going to die in the wilderness of sin. So then what does Moses say when he, when he hears these people fearing about the death, the certain death from the wilderness of sin? Well, Moses says in verse 13, Then Moses said, Fear ye not, stand still. Fear ye not, stand still. Notice what the next verse is in Romans 3, verse 21. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested. Now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested. Paul's writing about what Jesus Christ did on Calvary's cross. And he's saying it, it's not a matter of your sin, and it's not a matter of your righteousness, and it's not a matter of... You following the law, God has now presented His own righteousness. You don't have to fear. You can stand still because God's righteousness has been put forth. Moses said, fear ye not, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. And the verse says, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. It's something you can see. You can see in the scriptures the righteousness of God. Verse 22 in Romans, it's the righteousness of God which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe. Verse 24, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that's in Christ Jesus whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in His blood. Stand still and see the salvation of God at Mount Calvary. Don't worry about the wilderness of sin. Jesus has done the work. God's put forth His righteousness. It's witnessed by the prophets. Fear ye not. Stand still and see the salvation of God. Have faith in His blood. And then, and then Moses goes on and says to them, verse 14, The Lord shall fight for you, and ye shall hold your peace. Now, I thought about that for The Lord shall fight for me, and I shall hold my peace. The Lord shall fight for you, and you shall hold your peace. Well, first off, what he's saying is, <laughs> the Lord, in, back there, when they were getting ready to fight against Pharaoh and the host, the people are thinking, how are we going to fight? The men were thinking, how can we defend the women and children? What weapons do we have? We've got a couple of hoes. We've got a couple of plowshares here. We've got a couple of pruning hooks. Maybe we'll fight. And he's saying, no. The Lord will fight for you. Rather than holding your weapons, hold your peace. You don't need weapons of warfare. You don't need carnal weapons of warfare. Hold your peace. There's no jihad in God's army today. God's army is a spiritual army. It fights on its knees in prayer. We hold our peace. But watch, we were working our way through Romans. Look at Romans. Now he said, fear ye not, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord. The Lord shall fight for you. Romans chapter 4, the next chapter. Romans chapter 4, verse 21. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God, and being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was able also to perform, look at the end of verse 24, raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead who was delivered for our offenses and raised again for our justification. He says, the Lord shall fight for you. You know who fought the battle at Calvary? It was Jesus Christ. All they did was they stood and they watched him on Calvary's cross and he fought the battle with Satan and with sin and with death and he conquered it all. Jesus fought that battle physically and spiritually and he was delivered for our offenses and he was raised again for our justification. The Lord shall fight for you. Ye shall hold your peace. Look at the next chapter, next verse. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So we see this thing following along the picture historically and the spiritual implication of what Jesus has done for us on our behalf. And now we can hold our peace. Why? Because now we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. He's fought the battle. We can see the salvation that he's performed on Calvary's cross. And then he said in that 15th verse back in Exodus, 
Uh, wherefore Christ thou unto me, speak unto the children of Israel that they go forward. That they go forward. Okay, go back to Romans, to the sixth chapter now. After we've seen the battle won on our behalf, and now we have the peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, we get to the sixth. What's he talking about going forward? Well, now that you've received that salvation and you have that peace, he's looking at the spiritual growth and progression. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin? The grace may, be, may abound. God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer to sin? Verse 4, Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should, here we go, go forward, walking, walk in newness of life. Now that we have peace, what do we do? Now we walk in the Spirit. We go forward. We've been to Calvary. We've seen the work that God's done. We've believed in his salvation. We have our peace. And now we go forward and walk in newness of life and bring it forth to others. That's spiritually what the picture is being drawn right there. And the words line up so perfectly with the great doctrinal epistle of Romans that Paul writes to us through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. With Jesus Christ as the, the centerpiece of everything Paul is writing. Paul, did, Paul didn't just write to put some doctrine down. Paul didn't just write to build some kind of religious organization. Paul wrote so that people would see the righteousness of God witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God in Jesus Christ our Lord. We have peace with God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Jesus was delivered for our offenses. Jesus was raised for our justification. We joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ. It's all about Jesus. That's what Paul's writing about. I don't know how people miss it. But it lines up perfectly with what's happening here. It lines up absolutely perfectly that God is making a way for His people to go forward and to follow the Savior, Jesus Christ. Now the picture will continue back in Exodus. Go back to where we were in Exodus. I just wanted to show you that parallel that God was showing me this afternoon as I was studying. It, it's just... To me, it's always precious to see how the Bible lines up beautifully. And the parallels between the physical and the spiritual, between the earthly and the heavenly. Like Jesus said to Nicodemus, I speak to you of earthly things, I speak to you of heavenly things. They're going to line up perfectly. So, at one point here, I observed something curious. The, Moses made a great little sermon to the people in verses 13 and 14. Fear ye not, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will show to you today. For the Egyptians whom ye have seen today, ye shall see them again no more forever. The Lord shall fight for you, ye shall hold your peace. And then apparently a sermon was done, and I'm assuming from the way I read, the 15th verse, all of a sudden the Lord's saying to Moses, in kind of a very mild reproof, Hey, wherefore criest thou unto me? Speak unto the children of Israel, that they go forward. Apparently what happened was Moses, he had made his little preaching, and then he ran back and started praying to God, oh God, I hope you really do what I just said you were going to do because I, I'm a little worried about this. I mean, I just put you out on the line. And the Lord is saying to him, what are you crying to me for? Didn't I tell you I was going to do this? Do you really need to plead with me over something I said in my word that I was going to do? In other words, sometimes we pray about things that are already in the scriptures with, with a, a faint and nervous heart. And God says, you can, you can relax. When, when you have put forth my name according to my word, I'm going to be strong on behalf of those whose heart is perfect toward me. And so, Moses, you can get up from praying right now and go back to the people and now do the work that I've told you to do. In other words, obey that which I've told you to do. Lift up thy rod and stretch out thine hand over the sea. And the children of Israel shall go on dry ground through the midst of the sea. You know the rod, we've, we've studied it before earlier in our book of Exodus. The rod is a picture, of course the rod is what the shepherd uses to do the work that he's to do. Of course today the shepherd, the, shep, the under shepherd of the flock, is to use the rod to help the flock get to better pasture. The rod that's to be used is the word, the word of God. 
And what he's saying to the shepherd is, go back to the very source of strength where I first met you. Go back to the Word. Encourage the people in the Word again. Lift that up. Lift up the banner for your people. Lift up the banner. You know, we were talking about this because we were on a recent trip. And there were a number, a number of pastors around. And I was watching a number of them prepare their sermons. And, and, and I said to my wife, I, I only know one way to do it. I read and I read and I read and I write down what God gives me from the book. I, I don't know any other way. I, I don't know... I went to Sermon Prep and Delivery and they said you should always be on the lookout for catchy titles and you should always be on the lookout for catchy illustrations and you know write these things down in a book and, and I, I guess I work backwards from everyone. I just want to read this and let the Lord give me this and, and I'll lift this up. I keep saying I can't do it the other way. I just fall short of doing it any other way. I'm not good with catchy illustrations and titles and stuff like that. But this, you know, I was sitting here reading this today and the Lord showed me Romans so I showed it to you. I lifted up the rod. That's, that's all I know how to do. And, and, and the Lord says, go back and lift up the rod. Just take what I've given you and lift that up to the people. That will part the sea of trouble for them. That's what's going to work spiritually. Now verse 19, we see what happens. Next paragraph. And the angel of God, which went before the camp of Israel, removed and went behind them, and the pillar of cloud went from before their face and stood behind them. And it came between the camp of the Egyptians and the camp of Israel. And it was a cloud and darkness to them. But it gave light by night to these, so that the one came not near the other all the night. I just want to stop for a second and just look at the way God writes the scriptures. You know, he uses a lot of pronouns in the scriptures. Them and these and these and them. And it's so... You have to be so careful when you're reading through the scriptures. And I only say this to you because I want you to have a living, active relationship with the Lord and His Word. And so I know when I'm reading through, I'm, I'm always trying to make sure who the thems and the these are when I'm going through it. Now, God will help you by His Spirit. But that's what makes this a spiritually discerned book. Now, the way the Lord had been working with the people is He had been going before them in a pillar of cloud. And the way it would work was during the day, it would be a pillar of cloud. Maybe it looked like a tornado for all I know, a whirlwind. The Lord have it this way in the whirlwind. And it would lead them. But at night, instead of being a cloud, it would be a pillar of fire. But here in this particular night, all the night, last three words of verse 20, what he did was he divided the pillar into two. And on one side... I'll use red for the light. The pillar was giving off light. And on the other side, the pillar was giving off darkness. And so the Egyptians were cast under a cloud of darkness while the Jewish people, the children of Israel, were given light. by the very same mechanism. And, and the Lord shows how He put a division. It, again, it tells verse 20, It came between the camp of the Egyptians and the camp of Israel, and it was a cloud and darkness to them, that's the Egyptians, but it gave light by night to these, that's the children of Israel, so that the, the, the one came not near the other all the night. This kind of reminds me of the Bible. The Bible speaks of itself as a double-edged sword. The Bible is a two-edged sword. It's the same apparatus, if you will, and yet depending on who's looking at it, you either see light or you see darkness. Whether you look at it at the natural man, in the old man, it's a cloud of darkness to you. And if you have the new birth and you're translated to the kingdom of light, it gives light to you. And I can testify. Because <laughs> someone brought me a Bible a long time ago before I was saved. And I started to read it. And I said, this is a goofy book. It makes no sense at all. I said, it just doesn't make any sense. It's so confusing. And I don't know why anybody would read this thing. I said to my wife, throw this thing out. Get it out of the house. Of course, she didn't listen to me. She hid it somewhere. I found it a couple months later. I said, didn't you throw that thing out? It's taking up shelf space. Of course, people prayed for me. And praise the Lord, he drew me. 
and showed me my need, that I needed a Savior, that I was a sinner. And there was a day one, a number of years later, when I, I bowed the knee to God. And I placed my faith, I turned to God. And, I, and, I, and He turned me to His Son, Jesus Christ. And I placed my faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And I received the new birth. And, and the Spirit of God entered into me. And then I had an interest in the book and I started reading it. And all of a sudden, I had light. I said, boy, that, boy, that, that makes so much sense. I wonder why I never saw that before. I was on the wrong side. I was on the wrong side. Which side are you on? Yeah, the Lord would like you to be on this side. There's a mixed multitude here. He takes Jews and Gentiles. It's not just the children of Israel. And so this is what he did that particular night. Now, he shows you the crossing of the sea occurred during the night. Verse 20, the end of the verse. They came not near the other all the night. And Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord caused the sea to go back by a strong east wind all that night. So it was a night crossing for them. And the Lord provided light. The, the one half of the uh, cloud pro, uh, pillar provided light to them. Uh, let's see. Um, Cause the sea to go back, verse 21, all that night, and made the sea dry land, and the waters were divided. And so now the, the Lord divides the waters side to side. Now, I've read various estimates. We already know that there were at least 600,000 footmen. Back in Exodus chapter 12, verse 37, the children of Israel journeyed from Ramesses to Sukkoth, about 600. 100,000 on foot that were men, beside children, and besides women. So, I don't know, let's say there was three times that amount. That would make close to two million people. So now I got two million people, I want to march across this Red Sea. So if, if we march those two million, about uh, 500 abreast, we'd have a column 4,000 long. And God does things decently and in order. But this is some miracle because you're, you're moving that sea apart. You're, you're moving that 200 foot mass 12 miles across and far enough apart for maybe 500 men to go in abreast and cross on dry land. So a significant miracle. It's a mighty God we serve. I, I like being on his side. I don't know that he's ever on my side, but I like being on his side. That's the way it is, by the way, folks. Don't ask the question, is God on your side? The question is, are you on his side? He already knows the direction he's going in. And so he begins to, to lead the people forward on dry ground. This is happening during the night. Verse 23. And the Egyptians pursued and went in after them into the midst of the sea, even all Pharaoh's horses and his chariots and his horsemen. And it came to pass that in the morning watch the Lord looked unto the host of the Egyptians through the pillar of fire and of the cloud and troubled the host of the Egyptians and took off their chariot wheels, and they drave them. You hear the, the saying, and the wheels came off. The wheels were undone. That's where it comes from, right here. That's where a lot of, a lot of the common sayings that we use, the colloquial sayings, have come from the Bible, come from the Word of God. And the chariot wheels, uh, they drave them heavily, verse 25, so that the Egyptians said, Let us flee from the face of Israel, for the Lord fighteth for them against the Egyptians. So now the Jewish people are making their way across. The pillar of cloud is between them. But the, in their zeal to kill God's people, in their zeal to fight against God, the enemies of God have a real zeal. <laughs> Sometimes I think the Lord wishes we would have half the zeal they do. They, they're just kind of relentless. I mean, they never give up. You can kind of see this sometimes in politics. You watch in politics and, and there's a battle going on and finally the right prevails. A couple of attorneys will take it to the Supreme Court and the right will prevail. And you think that's the end of that matter and no sooner 24 hours later some other attack is made through some other appellate judge or, and they just never give up in attacking and doing the wrong thing. They have this zeal for going after truth. And here, and you see the picture with the Egyptians, they're going to go, let me tell you something, if I were an Egyptian, I'd have said, I'm not going after that tornado. <laughs> I'm no storm chaser. <laughs> if that thing turns back on us, we're in big trouble. I'll see you later, Pharaoh. 
I mean, I wouldn't have stayed in that fight, but they had a zeal to go after. And so they go after, and now the Lord turns upon them. And he looks back upon them, and the wheels start to come off. And the Lord is now fighting against them. And some of them said, let us flee from the face of Israel, for the Lord fighteth for them against the Egyptians. You know, at least there are some smart ones in the crowd that get the message. There are a few. That's why we continue to preach. Verse 26, And the Lord said unto Moses, Stretch out thine hand over the sea, that the waters may come again upon the Egyptians, upon their chariots, and upon their horsemen. And Moses stretched forth his hand over the sea, and the sea returned to his strength when the morning appeared. And the Egyptians fled against it, and the Lord overthrew the Egyptians in the midst of the sea, and the waters returned, and covered the chariots, and the horsemen, and all the host of Pharaoh that came into the sea after them, there remained not so much as one of them. And the Lord finished off the battle. The Lord didn't start the battle, but the Lord finished the battle. And he's an excellent finisher, 100%. And so Pharaoh doesn't end up on the side of the banks of the river, like you see in some of the movies, Pharaoh is drowned in the midst of the sea. Again, 200 feet of water coming upon you do a lot of damage. 12 miles across, 200 feet coming from both directions, you don't stand much of a chance. Even if you're a good swimmer, you're not going to come up against all that pressure. You're not going to make it 200 feet up. You're going to have the bends. You're going. You're just not going to make. They died, all of them. A personal scenario. Uh, there you go, a, a personal tsunami. So she said, "Amen." There it is. There it is. Now, as I was, we were going through before. I remember we were studying earlier in the book of Exodus. Remember how many plagues that the Lord had brought upon the Egyptians? Do you remember the number? It was ten, ten plagues. Ten plagues. The tenth one being the, the night that the death angel came and killed the firstborn. This is the 11th judgment that God brought on Pharaoh. And this one took the Pharaoh out himself. You remember we were studying Bible math, and I showed you 10 is the number of the law, but when you transgress the law, 11 is the number of judgment. Pharaoh had transgressed the 10 warnings. Now Pharaoh faces the judgment. 11 is the number of judgment in Scripture. And this is the 11th plague, if you will, the eleventh judgment to come upon Pharaoh and his people, and this finished them off all together. There's the other points I wanted to make here. It's some typology that's used. Repeatedly we saw the dry ground, the dry land, the dry ground. And who went on the dry ground? God's people. And then we saw the waters. And who ended up in the waters? The enemies of God. In the scriptures, you will find that dry ground or dry land is a picture of saved people. And the waters is a picture of lost people. Dry ground or dry land specifically, when you're looking at the Old Testament, is a picture of God's people, the Jewish people. And the waters or the seas are a picture of lost people or in the Old Testament Gentiles who did not know God. Let me show you this in the book of Revelation. Turn to Revelation chapter 13. Just so you get some typologies of going through the scriptures, it'll help you with your reading. Revelation 13. Verse 1, And I saw upon the sand of uh, the sea, and I saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns. Now this beast rising up is the Antichrist that will appear during the tribulation period. And the Antichrist, it says, comes out of the sea. So from the Old Testament typology, he's a Gentile. Turn to Isaiah chapter... 17. Keep your finger in Revelation. Isaiah 17. Isaiah 17 and look at verse 12. 
Woe to the multitude of many people which make a noise like the noise of the seas and to the rushing of nations that make a rushing like the rushing of mighty waters. Again, the nation Israel being separate, being the head of nations, but all the other nations, all the other peoples on the planet being likened to waters, to sea. So the Antichrist, you're learning right here in Revelation 13 verse 1, is going to be Gentile in nature. That's what you're learning, your typology. That's the picture you're getting from Exodus 14, from Isaiah, from Revelation. Now notice also in Revelation 13, another beast is going to appear. Verse 11, And I beheld another beast coming out of the earth. Revelation 13, 11. So the Antichrist, he comes out of the sea, he's a Gentile. Another beast comes out of the earth. He had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. This, this beast is the false prophet. This one comes out of the earth, the dry land. This is going to be Jew, or part Jew. The false prophet will be Jewish in his background. So I'm just showing you some typology when you read through the scriptures. It'll help you as you read through. And this is what's going on back here in uh, Exodus. He's laying down some of the typology to help you in, in your reading in the future. You know, the Holy Ghost has a particular style that he uses. And he uses certain similitudes and certain metaphors in his writings. And he wants you to be familiar with them. It'll help you in your understanding of scripture. So I point these out to you as we're passing uh, in this uh, 14th chapter. Now, one other thing I noticed, we look at the historical truth of this passage. And again, those of us that are Bible believers, we have no problem with this. Um, for, for example, talking about the uh, strong east wind that made the waters divide in 1421. That's not such a big feat, dividing waters left from right. You know what's a big feat? Go back to Genesis chapter 1. I'll give, you, I'll give you an amazing feat. Genesis chapter 1, verse 6. And God said, Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters. Let it divide the waters from the waters. Watch this. And God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament. And it was so. And God called the firmament heaven. That's quite a feat. God took waters that were on the earth from that flood in the second verse there, where God had flooded the earth with waters, and, and he lifted the waters off and put a canopy of waters above and had waters just like circulating up there in the sky. That, that's quite an amazing feat. And that was trillions upon trillions of gallons of waters because we know about that when we read about the Noahic flood. That, that's amazing. That was in the days before the flood when there was that beautiful canopy around the earth and the atmospheric pressure was greater than it is now and the, uh, the uh, oxygen content was about 50% greater than it is now and a man could live to a thousand years old and uh, you could get out and run a marathon of 200 miles before you'd get uh, winded. Those were the good old days <laughs> before the flood. Uh, of course, this will all be restored in the millennium. So, you know... Parting the Red Sea is not a big deal for those of us that believe in God. You know, I always say to someone, you talk to people all the time, oh, yeah, I believe in God. <laughs> well, you don't believe in much of a God. First off, if you believe in God, do you believe Genesis 1-1, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth? See, I believe in God, and I believe in God that created the heaven and the earth. Then everything else is kind of small potatoes. Parting the Red Sea is not a big deal for a God that spoke the heaven and earth into existence. <laughs> not a big deal to part the Red Sea. So, first off, historically... We saw that. We believe that. Spiritually, we saw the application. If you will indulge me, doctrinally, prophetically, could there be a significance to the passage? Prophetically? Well, I was thinking about it, and uh, I'm not 100% sure. We're just speculating here. We're having fun. We're not doing any harm to the Scriptures. And when we study the 15th chapter, you're going to see a little bit more, and we'll, we'll study it next week. But what's happened here is initially, a few days before this happened, about three days before this happened, God had the Passover. And through the blood of the Passover lamb, he ransomed his people out of Egypt. 
and yet the enemy was still around for a three-day period. And now, all of a sudden, he destroys the enemy. He delivers his people from the enemy, but with a harrowing escape. As they're running and the enemy is chasing behind them, and in front of them is water. Sometimes I wonder how that uh, water parted. It says, in, it says in Hebrews 11, let me see if I can find the passage. Just, just ponder this possibility. Hebrews is the uh, roll call of faith talks about the faithful that went before us and some of the things that they did. And in the 11th chapter of Hebrews, when it talks about them going through the Red Sea, it says in verse 29, By faith they passed through the Red Sea as by dry land. Now I know they went on dry land, but it says by faith they went through as by dry land. Yeah, she got it. <laughs> it's you know what might have happened? It might very well have been that Moses stood there on the bank of the Red Sea with his people and he lifted up his rod and he began to walk toward the water and as he walked toward it, it started to part. It's not like he held it up and it parted for 12 miles and he could see the other end of here where he was going. It parted one step at a time as he walked by faith. And they, they were walking right toward a wall of water. And every time they took another step, that part parted. And then that part parted. And then that part parted. And as they were walking, it parted step by step, inch by inch, Niagara Falls, the old Three Stooges. And, but it's very possible that's exactly what happened. And isn't that the way God works? I mean, we, we don't walk by sight. We walk by faith one step at a time. And the water was just parting for them. And, and in the meantime, those in the back are saying... Hurry up, the Pharaoh's on his way with the chariots. And so then I thought about this three days. Three days. And I thought about the day that we're going to be delivered. We have been ransomed. The blood of Christ has paid for all our sins, but we still have a host about us. And there's a day that the trumpet, on the third day, the trumpet will sound. And this is the third day this is happening. And, and, and on the third day, the trumpet will sound and we'll go up. And the Lord will begin to lead us back toward heaven. And do you know what's right underneath the throne of God is the, the, the deep, the watery, frozen sea of the deep, as we studied in the book of Job. And I have a feeling as we're on our way, the host is going to follow behind us and chase us. And the devil and his devils are going to be chasing. And the Lord's going to lead us himself. And the waters are going to part as we head our way right back into heaven. And the waters will part as the Lord's leading us up there. And the waters of the deep will separate. And we'll get right up into the throne room. And the Lord will shut the waters right back upon the devil and our enemies. And that'll be the last time we ever see him. And then just like he said here, Moses told the people. He says right here. In the 14th chapter. And, and ye shall see them again no more forever. And there's a day coming when we will have our full deliverance and glorification. We have been delivered from the penalty from sin when we were justified. If we stay close to God and are sanctified, we're delivered from the power of sin. But there's a day coming the glorification process when we will be delivered from the presence of sin and we will see sin and our enemies forever again, no more. Forever. And I think doctrinally that's what's being portrayed right here. There's, I'm going to have the great escape one day. It's going to be the, the ride of a lifetime. It's going to be the thrill as we go up. And by the way, I'm afraid of heights. But we'll have a new body as we go up and the Lord leads us up through the heavens, through the deep, into the throne room of God. All right, so finishing this chapter up, verse 30, Thus the Lord saved Israel that day out of the hand of the Egyptians, and Israel saw the Egyptians dead upon the seashore, and Israel saw that great work which the Lord did upon the Egyptians, and the people feared the Lord and believed the Lord and his servant Moses. By the way, and that's all God would have is for you and I to believe His Word and believe the, that which is written in the prophets about His Son, Jesus. Joe says we're running out of time. Any questions on what we looked at this week? Next week we'll study chapter 15, which is the first song ever recorded 
in the Bible. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the uh, picture that you show us of the great deliverance that you gave to your people, your children, thousands of years ago. Thank you for the spiritual truth and the ransom that you've paid on our behalf and the deliverance that we have and the full deliverance which we still await as we look forward in hope. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. Uh, help us this week as we go forth to tell others about the great salvation that God has provided in the person of his son, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen.